You're welcome back. So Lilian Thuram is a name that you will know well from being one of the most successful footballers of his generation. A key cog in that brilliant French side that won the World Cup in 1998 and the European Championship in 2000. Uh, he's in Dublin today with us in studio today for a very different reason. Uh, Lilian, thank you for coming in. Bah, écoutez, merci de m'inviter. Uh, you are with your interpreter, David Murphy, who's going to guide us through this as well. So 2008, uh, you set up the Lilian Thuram Foundation to educate against racism. And you have written this fascinating book. It's called White Thinking uh, Behind the Mask of Racial Identity. I spent the last week reading uh, the book. It is thoughtful. It's educational. It's incredibly well researched on a topic that people rarely talk about, which is what it means to be white and all the assumptions and all the benefits and the acceptance that goes with being white. Why did you write this book? Ben, j'ai écrit uh, ce livre pour qu'on puisse uh, I, I wrote this book because I wanted people to realize that we're all the product of a particular history and it's the, the history of the sort of racialization of the world that um, uh, you know, has divided the world into different racial categories. And I wanted us to be able to talk about these issues, you know, quietly and calmly uh, and respectfully. Et nous devons en discuter tranquillement, sereinement. I learned a huge amount from reading this in the research that you put in, which is clearly extensive. How much did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> Disons, vous savez que ce livre, c'est uh, le résultat uh, yeah, so de The book is in, in, in effect a product of a lifetime that when uh, I was nine years old um, uh, in, in school, uh, the kids call, called me a dirty black. And this is something that that stuck with me so that they hadn't those children had internalized uh, racist ideas um, I'm now in my 50s so f over 40 years later um, I've been thinking about these issues and want to uh, uh, engage with the idea that being white is considered better and that we need to get past that if we're going to create equality être blanc, c'était mieux et que nous devons prendre conscience que si nous voulons combattre le racisme, eh ben il faut enlever ces identités de couleur de peau que nous avons. Those comments when you were nine years of age, public comments, it's often how we discuss racism now. So particularly on a sports program, it's Vinicius Junior, it's an event at a football match, very public, obvious pronouncements of racism. What's clear from your book is that it's actually something far more deeply ingrained that we never actually talk about. It's, it's in our history books when we're in school. It's in the TV programs we watch that this is something that is centuries just ingrained into white people that we don't even think about and maybe subconsciously at times don't even realize. Ben, je dirais que, vous savez, euh, nous devons prendre conscience que le monde moderne s'est construit so sur the, les races. The modern world is built on the hierarchy of races. Um, for a long time, uh, racial laws existed that codified this, that placed white people at the, at the top of a, a racial hierarchy. And those laws have disappeared, but the, the ideas remain. So if we come back to Vinicius Jr., uh, we often think, you know, it's stupid people who say racist things in stadiums. Um, but that's not the whole story. They, they, those people are speaking in that way and acting in that way because of the legacies of those laws that were, uh, and that way of thinking that is ingrained in our society. C'est le résultat d'une histoire. Et il faut arrêter de dire que ce sont des personnes stupides qui font ça. Non, le racisme, c'est quelque chose de culturel. Euh, L'idée que les Blancs soient supérieurs aux non-Blancs, c'est in, inscrit euh, dans l'ADN euh, de notre construction, euh, euh, dans nos constructions identitaires. C'est exactement la même chose lorsque vous euh, voulez analyser... So it's the same with sexism, that, that, that hierarchy of, of men over women um, is, is something that is ingrained in our societies mais qui est ancré dans notre culture. You write about that, that we live in a world where men often dominate women from an early age, just as many white men learn to dominate black people. From your research, where do we learn that from? Où est-ce qu'on a appris ça? Mais vous savez, euh, yes. il y a so eu, these malheureusement, things have a long history. Um, every time we say that Columbus discovered America, we, we forget all about the, the, the massacres of the 90% of the population who were there before Columbus even got there. And after the massacre of these populations, we had slavery. Um, so there is a long inbuilt history of, of domination that's there in, in, in society that we just forget about.
90% de la population qui existait là-bas. Il y a aussi euh, le fait qu'après ces massacres, on a euh, malheureusement euh, euh, mis en place un système esclavagiste où est-ce qu'on a été chercher des personnes qui venaient d'Afrique. Et là aussi, pour légitimer cette violence euh, économique, on a construit l'idée euh, de l'infériorité de ces personnes noires. Et après, ça a enchaîné aussi avec la colonisation. Et ça ne fait pas très longtemps, encore, encore une fois, que nous acceptons l'idée que nous sommes égaux selon notre couleur de peau. You ask a lot of big questions in this book. One of them is, who is not white? And you say one of the powers that white thinking possesses is to determine who is and isn't white. That white people see the world quite often as white people, black people and others. <laughs> so en fait, je crois que ce qui est très intéressant que c'est... Yeah, so generally général, speaking, white people don't think of themselves as white that their whiteness is actually neutral. It's um, it's not a color at all. And when, you, they, when white people speak about um, black people, they refer to them as people of color, as though they didn't have uh, a color themselves. Um, so it's that we need to get out of that neutrality of thinking about the identities that, that, that we have, that we don't reveal to ourselves. En fait, intervient dans leur façon de penser le monde. As you've gone around France, gone around different countries, speaking to people, both researching the book, but also talking about your findings. When you when you have those conversations about them with what it means to be white, what what is the general reaction? So I, g- I give uh, an example in, in the book where I call up my friend Frank and uh, I say, Frank, I'm black. Uh, so what are you? And he says, um, well, I'm normal. And Frank doesn't see his own whiteness as something that marks him as, a, as, a, as an identity. And uh, th- this is a sort of general issue that white people don't see themselves as part of a history, a white history of the world that have created all of these racial categories. And that's something they need to find out about. Comme le monde s'est construit sur une supr- la suprématie blanche, ils n'ont pas conscience qu'en fait, que nous sommes dans une suite logique de l'histoire. Et donc ça les interpelle, ça les questionne et ils sont surpris. Vous parlez de la l'histoire dans le livre, et les gens ne voient pas comme des esclaves, mais ce n'est pas ce que la l'histoire dit. History bah, je parle, oui, effectivement, dans le livre de l'esclavage, mais toutes les populations so du I, monde I speak about ont subi slavery in the book. Um, the fact is that all parts of the world, as you said, are, are, were experienced slavery. What happened, though, with the transatlantic slave trade is that slavery became racialized and it was associated with, with black people. Um, and slavery was followed by colonization. And colonization uh, put forward the argument that we've liberated the slaves, but we now need to educate them to bring them up to our uh, standard uh, of living. So this is this is a history that we need to, to understand better about how slavery came about and, and the, the different contexts in which it's existed and that it's not simply something associated with black people. Les indigènes, en disant que la race supérieure, la race blanche, était là pour justement éduquer les indigènes qui sont inférieurs. De toute façon, vous savez, les colonisateurs, lorsqu'ils colonisent... Yeah. Peu, so, so colonization rapport, creates a, a sense of inferiority in those who are colonized, and that's in the case in all sorts of different contexts. But that modern form of colonization where race is involved um, inculcated the idea that um, to be of a different color was to be inferior. And, and the, w- the world is sort of still trapped within that framework, that way of thinking about different races couleur de peau. On a dit qu'il y avait des races supérieures à d'autres et le répétant sans cesse, ben les gens ont fini par croire que c'était vrai. And France is still trying to take advantage in those colonies. You outline, is it French uranium comes from Niger and the benefit that is there to the French economy taking advantage of the people in Niger. Mais vous savez, c'est pas c'est pas simplement euh, la France. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's important to say it's not just France <laughs> that, that, that does the, the, this type of um, uh, thing and, and that, that uh, violent, uh, violent and, and uh, exploitation of, of different parts of the world. Um, I want to say the, the famous French philosopher Voltaire in, in the 18th century, he wrote that um, slavery was the price we pay to have sugar on our tables. 
And if we look at the world now, we could say that um, uh, the exploitation of uh, workers in the Congo is the price we pay to have mobile phones because of the natural resources that are taken from the land in, in places like the Congo to make sure that we can all you know, scroll, scroll through the, the, on the internet and so on. Um, so that we take we're still in a world where natural resources are taken from uh, poor people who are, are, are work in terrible conditions and that's something we need to understand better fait de profiter euh, des matières premières de certains endroits du monde et pour cela il faut construire l'idée encore une fois que ce sont des, des gens pauvres, des gens sous-développés et de masquer cette violence économique dans laquelle nous vivons. You talk about the opportunities available to young black people, also women in comparison to white men and that natural white superiority that it sort of inherent attitude from white people that they're better suited to management positions, to the CEO role, whereas somehow black people are better suited to uh, being cleaners, more menial tasks, that this is inbuilt into people's psyches. Do you see a change in that? Have you seen a change in that over the course of your life? That Do you feel there are more opportunities now for young black people? Alors tout d'abord, euh, je pense que les choses évoluent parce que nous discutons. First of all, it's a good thing that we're, we're talking about racism and sexism, and that, that's a good start. Because um, if we accept hierarchies within society, we're creating a dangerous situ situation for everybody, and that includes white people too, because there are white people who ex are exploited by the, the, the systems we have in place, and that... The, the, this racial thinking that, that we have in the world is based on an e econo economic system that um, uh, is built on exploitation, that exploits the natural resources of the world, that uh, exploits those who are poor and at the bottom end of society. And we need to create um, a politics of solidarity um, and that reaches out across, so reaches out across different so-called races so that we can see that where there's a sense of common humanity um, that goes beyond profit. Donc voilà pourquoi pour moi il faut construire des des politiques de de solidarité qui vont redistribuer les richesses. Ce n'est pas simplement un problème de genre ou, ou de couleur de peau. Voilà. C'est vraiment un système économique que nous devons changer pour que euh, qu'on comprenne que Uh, c'est juste uh, non acceptable qu'il y ait une minorité de gens uh, qui accaparent toute uh, la grande majorité des richesses du monde. Et en, il ne faut jamais oublier que pendant la période de l'esclavage, uh, yeah. par exemple, so we dans les during the slave Europe, uh, era, um, when trans transatlantic slavery was practiced, that there were very poor people exploited in Europe as serfs or peasants, and that th there wasn't equality here either mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the Western world. Uh, just to talk football for a moment in the context <laughs> of this book, uh, and the inequality and the lack of opportunities for former black players, particularly in the Premier League. You look at right now, since Patrick Vieira was sacked as Crystal Palace manager, I don't think there's a single black manager in the Premier League. And even then, Patrick Vieira yeah. is probably the best black player ever to play in the Premier League. So I had to have that level of status to be able to get that job in the first place. And we've had Ian Wright, Saul Campbell on this show over the last couple of years, uh, frustrated with the lack of opportunity, not just for themselves, but uh, for players they would have played with. Considering the amount of quality that is in that league, the amount what black players have offered to that league in terms of quality of football and entertainment. Why do you think we're still in a position where they can't get those jobs? C'est très difficile de répondre à la question en, en très peu de temps. Yeah. Mais ça participe well, it's difficult à la to give a brief answer uh, to that question because it's such a complicated issue. Um, but it's fundamentally linked to how we imagine the world and, and different ra races as we know, are given different attributes. You know, the white people are, are, you know, are linked to thinking and logic and so on, and black people with all of these ideas about physical attributes and being um, you know, good at sport. Um, and we are in a situation where black players think that it's, it's not worth trying, to, when you finish your career, to going into these areas because they don't see black faces in those roles. And that's not something where you, you will get a, a chance to succeed. 
est plus compliqué pour moi. Donc je préfère choisir un autre chemin. Et donc voilà pourquoi il faut avoir le courage de s'arrêter, d'analyser les choses et de se dire que peut-être que oui, effectivement, c'est anormal qu'il y ait aussi peu euh, d'entraîneurs non blancs euh, dans les cinq grands championnats, alors qu'il y, euh, il y, a, il y a beaucoup de joueurs non blancs. Que ce soit lorsque vous êtes joueur de foot, que ce soit lorsque vous êtes entraîneur de foot, Yeah, so no, no matter whether you're a player or a coach or a manager, um, as a black person, you, you need to be aware that you will always be judged more severely. So that you have to try that much out. And when you fail, it's a much more significant failure that you, you, you won't get another chance. Certain shows. You've been in, when you look at your time with France and then at Barcelona towards the end of your career, even in two of the greatest dressing rooms in terms of success and quality of football and the brilliance of the players. When you reflect on those times and the conversations you would have as a group, would you have felt what you're talking about there that when you looked around that dressing room that your opportunities are going to be different from Xavi or Didier Deschamps because of the color of your skin? Yeah. Mais quand vous êtes, <laughs> quand vous êtes un joueur, une personne noire, So, so as a black person, yeah, you're always aware that you won't have the same possibilities uh, uh, as white people in, in, in the society we live in. It's, it's not just in football, it's across society and it, it's just a fact. À atteindre le très très haut niveau et ça c'est pas simplement dans les vestiaires de foot, c'est juste que vous êtes conscient de la réalité dans laquelle vous vous trouvez. Did writing this book change your opinion on white thinking, white people? <rire> Alors tout d'abord, euh, euh, il faut savoir que lorsque je parle de la pensée blanche, ce so pas when euh, I la speak pensée about, des blancs. Um, uh, white thinking in, in the book, um, it's not the, the way that white people think. It's, it's a way of understanding and perceiving the world that I'm talking about in the book that affects, shapes how white people, the, the, the world is perceived. So it's not just white people think like that. It's a whole way of seeing the world. Mm. Et les, et les personnes noires aussi. And black people too can see the world through that lens of white thinking. Uh, it's been brilliant to have you in the studio. Um, thank you so much for coming over and uh, spending some time with us. Uh, before I came in, I was looking online, and uh, so both of your sons are being our professional footballers. Uh, one played against Ireland last time. I think Kefran maybe in the. Uh, Ireland again in the France squad when Ireland go to Paris in September. Uh, there's all sorts of transfer rumors. So there's a flight tracker following where Kefran is right now and is he on his way to Liverpool? So we can do one or two things. You can either tell us where he's going to sign, <laughs> or we can just make up a story and run with it, and then we'll just throw it out there and let it let it fly. Bah, écoutez, c'est vrai qu'effectivement. Uh euh, Moi-même, euh, so, euh, I've been reading euh, things on social media too, <laughs> but you need to be aware that there's a lot of uh, false stories that circulate on social media. Yeah. C'est c'est très souvent faux. Voilà, c'est très souvent faux. <laughs> you must be incredibly proud of the two of them. It's so tough to become a professional footballer, but also with the pressure of your dad being such a successful player that they were able to to embrace that, to work with that, and to go on and, and lead the careers that really they're just starting on. Je dirais que c'est pas de la c'est pas de la fierté. Je I wouldn't say que I'm mes proud. Enfants, euh, I'd say I'm impressed by, by both of my boys um, because they've shown great character, uh, a lot more character than, than I had at that age to get to get to where they to where they are today. Et, euh, ceux qui doivent affronter depuis qu'ils sont petits, voilà. Well, if they end up with the same amount of medals, I think they'll have been doing all right. Uh, Lillian, thank you so much. Uh, David, thank you for coming in as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.